Happy New Year, everyone. These following stories are taken from the latest series of my podcast, Deliver Us, which is available on Apple Podcasts and most other podcasting platforms. For those new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy my storytelling and check out the podcast in the links in the channel description. One of the big questions surrounding experiences with the paranormal is are the things people experiencing simply manifestations of their imagination caused by stressful and negative experiences or emotions? Or do these entities or spirits feed off our negative emotions, enabling them to manifest into something we sense, hear, smell, or in some cases see? How you answer this question will largely depend on your level of scepticism regarding the paranormal. However, even if what people report as paranormal phenomena can be explained away by rational explanations and responses of the brain, it doesn't make it any less terrifying to those experiencing the occurrences who believe wholeheartedly that what they are experiencing is real. The following story is an ongoing situation that has befallen two young women during a major transition period in their lives and how they are struggling to get the help they need due to people refusing to believe their story. Welcome to Deliver Us. Rebecca Horton was a music industry major at a university in Kentucky who had a desire to go into entertainment law. She attended her first piano class in college wearing a backpack that had the logo from the TV series Supernatural, of which she was a big fan. This attracted the attention of Amy, who was also a fan of the show, and immediately a friendship blossomed between the two. They were inseparable throughout their time in college. Even when Amy got into a serious relationship with her boyfriend, Paul, her and Rebecca remained close. When they were about to go into their final year, Rebecca moved into the house that Amy and Paul lived in with Paul's friend. It seemed like the ideal setup, all close friends and reasonable rent for their final year in college. There was one issue in that they didn't have much in the way of furniture in the new house. New furniture was a little out of the budget for the students. However, shortly into the first semester of that year, a relative of Paul's passed away and they were able to acquire some of the furniture and make the house a little more livable. It was after getting the furniture that Rebecca started to experience a sense that someone was watching her around the house. She also became aware that objects were getting moved of their own accord. Amy identified as being an empath, someone who is sensitive to the energy and emotions of others. As a result, she is sensitive to the paranormal. Rebecca decided to speak to Amy about her experiences and see if she had sensed anything as well. Amy acknowledged the activity that had been going on in the house, and although this didn't take away the feeling of being uncomfortable, it did offer some comfort that they were both experiencing the same thing. One night, Amy had a large number of papers to work on. Paul and Greg were out for the night, and she asked Rebecca if she would be willing to stay up with her while she studied. What with everything going on, she didn't want to be alone. Rebecca was happy to oblige. Amy was working away in their designated study room and Rebecca was practicing on the piano. The night was cold, so they had the heating on in the house. The room in the house was warm, yet at some point in the evening, they felt the room go incredibly cold. Then they heard the sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. Initially, they thought it was the boys who had come back and were coming up to say goodnight. The door was open, and they had a direct sight of the hallway outside. They turned to look, but as the sound of the footsteps stopped outside the room, they did not see the boys, but something more sinister. Amy asked Rebecca if she could see what was out there. Rebecca saw something, but couldn't make out anything other than a strange, misshapen shadow. Amy, being more sensitive to the paranormal, was able to make out the face of a child. She described it as having sunken features and blackened eyes. What they were seeing eventually faded, but the feeling that something was watching them remained. Eventually the boys came home, and although the girls were put at ease by their presence returning to the house, they still remain unnerved. 
Paul and Greg were sceptical of anything paranormal happening in the home and dismissed the experience merely as the two girls being freaked out by their own imaginations whilst being in the home alone. The four students went to bed. For Rebecca, sleeping alone meant her imagination ran wild, terrified of any noise she could hear in the house or shadows she could see in her room. She was raised a Catholic, however her family considered her rather unorthodox in her religious beliefs as she did believe in the paranormal and in alternative methods of spiritual healing. She decided the best thing to do was to try to sage the house, as an attempt to cleanse it of any unwanted spirits and energy. The following day, Rebecca and Amy went to a local store to find sage that they would be able to burn in a cleansing ceremony. When they got back to the house, they started in the basement, which was the area in the house they would do laundry, and the boys would sometimes play video games. The back of the house went out onto a lower level of the front of the house, so there were doors in the basement that opened to the back garden. They began burning the sage, and once finished in the basement, they went up and covered the first floor. They got to the stairs and were about to walk up to the second floor when Rebecca, who was leading, stopped when she saw the black shadow at the top of the stairs in the same place she saw it the previous night. Once again, the presence appeared differently to Amy as it did to Rebecca. The girls slowly walked up the stairs. As they approached whatever it was they saw, it slowly moved from the top of the stairs and towards Amy's room. Once they got to the landing, it was out of sight. They proceeded with their ritual throughout all the rooms and closets in the top floor. However, once they got to the last room, which happened to be Amy and Paul's room, the entity they had seen was no longer present. They assumed that what it was must have left as a result of the sage they were burning. Once they had finished, they went back down to their kitchen. Amy started to feel uneasy, and Rebecca felt the room go cold. It was at this point that they realised that they had forgotten to include the kitchen closet in their cleanse, so they concluded the entity must have taken residence in there. Rebecca, returning to her Catholic roots, fetched some holy water she had in her room and used it as a way to chase off the spirit once and for all. After this, everything seemed to die down for a short while. Rebecca was even able to sleep with the lights off. But then, a couple of months later, out of seemingly nowhere, the feeling of being watched came back to Rebecca. She dismissed it as her imagination being triggered by some sort of anxiety brought on by her approaching the end of her time at college and whatever the future might bring. Most weekends, Rebecca went to Louisville to stay with her family and work as her weekend job that supported her studies. One weekend, she was arriving back from Louisville on a Saturday night. As she pulled up to the house, something in her bedroom window caught her eye. She looked up and saw the silhouetted shape of a person in the window. She rushed into the house and up the stairs to her room, but no one was in there. Hoping that it was just one of her housemates popping into her room to fetch something, she searched the house and discovered that Amy was the only person there. She denied going anywhere near her room. Rebecca asked Amy if she had been experiencing anything going on again in the house, as she herself had been feeling the sense of being watched Anne had just seen the figure in her window. Amy acknowledged that the feeling of a presence had indeed returned and agreed she would keep a lookout for anything out of the ordinary occurring. The following evening, Paul and Greg came home from college and weren't in the mood to eat at home so they decided to head out for dinner. They asked if Rebecca and Amy would like to join them and they both declined wanting to save some money and cooking for themselves and catching up on some studying. After eating together, Amy decided to take a shower and so Rebecca went to her room to do some schoolwork. After maybe ten minutes or so, she was interrupted by the sound of someone calling a name from somewhere inside the house. Thinking it must have been Amy needing something in the shower, she made her way to the bathroom. Once she got there, Amy was just getting out of the shower and when Rebecca asked her what she wanted, Amy claimed she'd never said anything. The girls stood there confused for a few minutes, when out of nowhere, 
they heard a door slam shut somewhere in the house. They gasped out of shock and stood there frozen with fear. Amy called out to Paul and Greg, hoping it was them getting back from their evening out. When there was no reply, the girls tentatively did a search of the house, expecting to find an intruder. When they searched the top floor, they discovered one side of the hallway had dropped considerably in temperature. Realizing there was no one else in the house, they wanted to get to the bottom of which room door had slammed shut. Amy stayed near the bathroom whilst Rebecca tried to replicate the sound by slamming each door in the house. It didn't take long to discover the door that slammed was the one leading to an unoccupied room in the house. This also happened to be in the same area of the hallway where the cold spell they felt earlier was. The room itself was freezing cold. Rebecca immediately went down the stairs to fetch her holy water, leaving Amy with nothing to protect her but a crucifix from her bedroom. Amy was in no way religious, but was open to anything in the heat of the moment. Upon returning from the kitchen, Rebecca was running past a room downstairs that would be best served as a dining room, but was ultimately left unused, when something caught her eye making her stop. In the room was a large mirror in which Rebecca not only saw her own reflection, but that of a dark figure standing behind her. Fear took over her as she didn't wait to investigate who or what it might be, and she ran up the stairs to rejoin Amy. The two girls went from room to room blessing them with the holy water. For some reason, Amy was too scared to go near the windows, and so left those areas to Rebecca. When Rebecca went near the window, she would see the black figure outside the house staring back at her. It was almost as if the holy water had driven it out of the house, but it was still able to linger outside waiting for them. This was where they would see the entity from now on outside, staring in at them. They did feel a sense of comfort that it was out of the house, but a great sense of uncertainty about whether or not it would return. Rebecca went to get help from a local church, but the pastor dismissed her claims as nothing but signs of stress and an overactive imagination. They have considered getting a spiritualist involved to help them, but that would cost money the two students couldn't afford, and it may go towards nothing more than a scam artist. So they continue to live there, in fear that the entity will find its way back into the home in which they live. Coming to the end of your time at university and facing the realities of starting your career in the real world is not without its uncertainty and stress. Could these events have been brought on by this? One theory a spiritualist friend of the two girls had was that the entity appeared differently to them in an attempt to tap into their desires. Rebecca shared with me that Amy was at a stage in her life when she wanted nothing more than to be a mother, and that was why the entity took on the form of a child. Rebecca, on the other hand, was still looking for someone with which to have a long-term relationship, and that was why what she saw manifested in the form of a man. The thought that this thing was taking on a form of something that would potentially entice them became even more disturbing. Castles are shrouded in mystery which to many invokes more than a little curiosity. Built to house, protect, and even imprison royalty and aristocracy over the centuries, we can't help but want to uncover the dark events of these buildings' pasts. One thing we know for certain is that these places have seen their fair share of death and dark histories, making them not only places of interest to historians, but also those fascinated with the paranormal. Dudley Castle is a ruined fortification that is situated in the West Midlands in England. Destroyed by fire in 1750, its grounds are now home to a zoo alongside what remains of the buildings. There are a number of reports of paranormal activity in the castle dating back as far as the 1870s. When the castle became a tourist attraction, guides would describe the sighting of an elderly couple dressed in 17th or 18th century clothing walking the grounds and then disappearing. The zoo was opened in 1937, and over the years staff reported unexplained occurrences whilst working there. Moans and groans would frequently be heard, doors closing of their own accord and footsteps echoing throughout the undercroft. Sightings of a woman in a nightgown roaming the grounds were reported by staff and visitors. 
hooded figures were also frequently seen throughout the ruins. These reports sparked a number of paranormal investigations at Dudley Castle. Occasionally, those out on visuals would report the feel of a cold hand touching their shoulder. Of course, speculation of the origin of these occurrences led to a plethora of urban legends. One includes the story of a witch who lived in the ruins who was killed when some locals discovered her affiliation with witchcraft. Depending on your belief, it can take a good deal of courage to partake in an investigation into the paranormal. Those that do have it in themselves to venture into reportedly haunting buildings for a night of discovery of the unknown do so in the hope that once the night is over and they leave the location, the presence will be left there. But what if something were to follow someone back after leaving? Welcome to Deliver Us. Cherie Herbert lives in Leicestershire in the UK and was involved in spirituality from a very early age. Her mother, a believer in the paranormal, frequently took her to a local spiritualist church. Outcast by the mainstream Christian church for attempting to communicate with the dead, this community would regularly meet with a medium and aim to reach out to those who have passed over. Exams are always a stressful period in a child's life. Cherie was about to enter this period in her school years when her grandmother, who passed away before she was born, reached out to her at one of these events. She communicated with her not to worry, as she would be there supporting her throughout this difficult time. These events led to a fascination with the paranormal, and when she was considered old enough, Cherie joined a paranormal investigation team. Being only a short drive away for most members of the team, Dudley Castle would end up being a regular location for investigations and visuals. Despite Cherie's fascination with the paranormal, she didn't consider herself in any way sensitive to such activity and always looked for rational explanations to any occurrences. As much as she enjoyed shows like Ghost Hunters, she always found them over the top and sensationist with their tendencies to jump to demons as an explanation to everything. She and the team had been to the castle many times and witnessed no activity during their investigations. However, during their later visits, a series of unexplained occurrences started to take place that made them consider the possibility that something malevolent resided there. Mark was a medium that was the founder of the team. Cherie described him as a physical medium, which differs from the ability of a psychic medium. Psychic mediums have the ability to communicate with spirits and relay messages via their spirit guide. Physical mediums have the ability to use their energy to interact with spirits. When Mark would attend vigils, things would escalate during their investigations. Objects would get thrown. They would hear growling noises and people would be physically harmed by unseen forces. It was almost as if some negative energy was drawn to him. So when Mark joined them on an investigation at Dudley Castle to begin with, it was the same uneventful experience as the previous visits. The event was drawing to a close as they congregated all the guests into the undercroft for the final exercise which came in the form of a seance. The undercroft had church pews in which the guests sat observing the seance. Cherie and the rest of the crew had picked up all the equipment in other areas of the location, quietly entered the undercroft and stood watching the seance at a distance so as not to disturb anything. Nothing seemed to be happening until one of the people involved in the seance reacted to something. His face quickly turned to one side and he audibly expressed pain. Concerned, everyone rushed to find out if he was okay. He explained he felt as if someone had struck him and that the side of his face was hot. He expressed he was okay and that they could continue with the seance. They proceeded with the experiment. After a short while of inactivity, they decided to take a break. As soon as the lights went on, the person who had felt the strike across the face reacted with shock which caused commotion amongst the team. People rushed to see what was wrong, and with the lights turned on, they were able to see four scratches on his face. They weren't scratches made by a human. This was determined by the fact that they weren't wide to match a human's fingernail, but thin like some sort of animal's claws. The scratches were deep enough to draw blood, 
and so first aid had to be administered. Everyone was clearly shaken up, but curiosity led them to regain their composure in order to be able to carry on with the seance. Cherie was stood on the outside of the gathering of people observing the activity. Her teammates were on her left, and to her right was a space which, other than an empty coffin, was unoccupied. As she observed the seance, she had the sense that someone or something was occupying the space to her right. The feeling grew, and became so strong she was compelled to look and see what was there. She saw an indeterminable shape in the darkness. She described as it being like when you see something in the corner of your eye, a shape moving that you can't quite make out what it is. Yet, she was looking directly at it. Unnerved but in control of her emotions, she refrained from saying anything. Firstly, because she didn't want to disturb the seance, but also because she was fully aware that simply stating that you think you might be seeing something can influence others to feel the same, even when there is nothing there. Instead, she asked one of her teammates if they wouldn't mind switching places with her, to which they obliged. The person with which she switched places with was one of the team skeptics, and so as the exercise continued, Cherie observed to see if he would react to the same thing she felt. She saw him shift uncomfortably where he stood. He turned to stare at the same empty space where she thought she saw something. After the seance, Shree confronted him about whether or not he saw something, and he flat out denied seeing anything. This wasn't uncommon behaviour for this individual, but over the years they knew each other, Cherie would often bring it up in conversation, only to have him dismiss whatever she thought she saw as something in her mind. The seance was eventually brought to a close, and once everything was packed up, everyone was free to leave. According to Cherie, the only people who profit from paranormal investigations are those who are lucky enough to be commissioned for a TV series or are complete charlatans looking to exploit gullible people. Cherie and the team she worked with were neither, so any money paid by their guests was only in place to cover the costs. Nevertheless, Halloween was always going to be a popular night for a vigil, and what better place to take paying guests than what could be one of the most haunted castles in England? So the following Halloween, the team planned a return trip to Dudley. Cherie was stood with some of the team having a cigarette break before the evening's events were about to take off. The medium Mark was escorting some of the guests around the grounds. The team's cigarette break was cut short by one of the guests rushing up to them and calling for them to help. Mark, they explained, had somehow become possessed. They quickly followed the guest to the location of the occurrence. They arrived to see his face and body twisted and contorted. They recognised it as Mark, but he had changed drastically. His voice changed as he spoke words that didn't form any type of coherent sentence. Some people tried to approach him to calm him down, but he lashed out violently, causing some people to become injured. For Cherie, Seeing her close and trusted friend change personality in such a drastic way was disturbing to say the least. In order to remove Mark from the situation, it ended up taking a team of six people picking him up and restraining him as he thrashed to break free. As they carried him through the ruins, the overwhelming smell of sulfur surrounded them. Once they got him outside, the other medium on site sat with him and managed to calm both Mark and the situation, leaving those who witnessed the occurrence scarred by what they had seen. Later that same evening, Cherie was being driven home. At some point in the journey, she began to feel unwell. She passed out and didn't come around until she was back at her house. This was the first time she had experienced anything like this. She had never before collapsed unexpectedly, so she was somewhat taken aback. She arrived to an empty home. Despite having the courage to partake in paranormal investigations, she admits to not feeling comfortable returning to an empty home the night after a ghost hunt, especially one as negative as she had just experienced. This time, however, she had reason to be afraid. As soon as Cherie was in bed, she heard the sound of someone moving around in her empty house. She could clearly distinguish the sound of footsteps walking up and down the stairs, 
and eventually end up outside her door. The strangest thing about this was that Shireen knew that she should have been scared because of what she was hearing, but instead she felt an overwhelming sense of calm come over her, allowing her to relax and fall asleep. Her usual routine after a ghost hunt was to lay in bed with the lights on watching Disney movies because she was always too scared to sleep. It made no sense to her as to why she felt so at peace with his presence roaming around her home. Some time passed, and another hunt was booked at Dudley Castle. As soon as Cherie left her home to head to the location, she all of a sudden felt unwell. It was exactly the same feeling she felt when she left Dudley Castle the last time. She was picked up by one of her teammates and as she got closer to the castle her feeling worsened to the point where she thought she might pass out again. There was a hill that led up to the castle and as Cherie battled the feeling whilst walking up there she took her concerns to one of the mediums saying she thought something must have attached itself to her after the last investigation. Before the medium could do anything they had walked inside the ruins and the feeling lifted from Cherie just as quickly as it came over her. This was the last strange experience she encountered at Dudley Castle. Being of rational mind, she didn't want to jump to the conclusion that this was a demonic force of any kind. However, it's difficult to conclude these occurrences could simply be caused by some residual energy when you consider the fact that the presence followed Cherie home, and we assume, back to the castle. Cherie and the team have not since returned to Dudley Castle. Maybe at some point in the future they will and get closer to explaining the experiences they encountered. This story was based on true events, and was written, narrated and produced by me, James Deverell. The names of those involved have been changed. Thank you for listening to this podcast. This podcast was made possible by the person who agreed to let me tell their story. It was also made possible by you, my listeners. Without you, I wouldn't feel compelled to find these stories write and narrate them, and share them with you on this platform. I love telling stories, and I truly believe there is great importance for storytelling in our world. It invokes the imagination and opens us up to a greater sense of empathy through shared human experiences. That is the reason I do what I do, and I one day hope I am able to do it a lot more than I am currently able to. So, if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and help it to grow by subscribing on the platform you are listening on and leaving a positive review. To go beyond this episode and get access to the original Skype interview with the person who is featured in this story, go ahead and check out my Patreon account. Patreon contributors donating $5 or more get access to exclusive interviews and a Patreon-only audio feed in which I narrate the original stories I find. To keep up to date with me on social media, go ahead and check me out on Twitter at at daredevril or Instagram at jamesdevril. Thank you again for listening.